Kia ora koutou katoa. Good morning. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, what I thought I'd do is just try and give you a really quick uh, snapshot of Auckland, gives you that little bit of context, um, talk a little bit about what uh, where we've come from since the amalgamation and talk about the emerging conversations that we are having in Auckland and that we want to uh, do something meaningful about over the next few years. Uh, so look, Auckland's got just over 1.5 million people at the moment and the, the big deal with that is that when you, when you know how, how poorly prepared those 1.5 million people are for something significant that will happen, not if, it will happen, uh, we have a very, very big critical mass of citizens who will not be able to cope. And so you've just got to hold that in your mind without it overwhelming you, uh, and you need to hold it in your mind every day because uh, let's just assume that we agreed uh, that 50% of our city's population kind of had some idea what to do. The scary bit is that there's 750,000 people who have no idea what to do and most of them don't speak English, and we'll be trying to communicate with them in English. So Auckland has some unique challenges, and what we're trying to do is bring an optimistic view to how we can actually change um, our community's resilience and their thinking and action about what they should do. So we're predicting Auckland's population on a medium growth curve will go to over 2 million in about 25 years' time. Uh, it will continue to be uh, representative of about a third of the people that live in this country. We have 200 ethnicities in Auckland. Uh, we have 820 new residents arriving in Auckland every week at the moment. So around about 43 to 44,000 people per annum. That's high growth. So we are at the moment, we're experiencing high growth. And just to give you a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a picture about what that looks like, essentially we need to build 340 houses a week in Auckland to house those people. We, we build a new suburban street in Auckland every two days, so the network that emergency services and people have got to know about, the network is marching its way um, up and out uh, every two days. Eight classrooms a week. We need eight extra classrooms a week to accommodate the school children that are arriving and being born in Auckland. The other unique uh, part of the workforce in Auckland is that 40% of the current workforce were not born in New Zealand and many of those people, uh, English is their second language. So we have a massive communication challenge uh, that we're thinking about. Uh, bringing our optimistic view to the, to the fore, Auckland Council and the council, the group, so our council controlled organisations and the council itself, we have 9,100 uh, full-time equivalent staff. So we have a massively um, motivated and available workforce to actually join in the resilience conversation and share that into their communities. So we have a pillar of what we're trying to achieve in the organisation and it's called making our size work. And it's about the, the upside of being big, not the challenges and the, some of the negative things that go with being big and slow and uh, not, not displaying the agility that we would like to. Uh, look, in the civil defence and emergency management space, the designers of the super city decided to put in place a dedicated unit uh, that stood alone and separate from other divisions in the council, and that what they set about doing was merging eight existing uh, CDM arrangements into a single uh, into a single unit. We're a unitary council, so we don't have a joint committee. We have a group committee 
uh, which has about half of our councillors on it. And we invite all of our emergency services partners and other agencies to come and be part of that group committee. We have 170 politicians uh, who are leaders of the Auckland Council. Uh, it's the biggest political organisation in Australasia um, when you think about it in those terms. And 149 of those elected politicians are community leaders, so they're the local board members, and they all need a role to play. They all need uh, to have a place in the sun in this conversation about resilience. Uh, I th I'm guessing we've probably got one of the biggest kegs in New Zealand as well, because we're all in. It's not just the councils and the CDM people. All of our partners are members of the keg. So when we're all there, there's about 20 of us in the room, uh, and it, it, it's, it, it works. We need to energise it and give it a stronger purpose, but having everyone at the table uh, is better than, in my view, than not having them there. Uh, we've also uh, made a decision last year to reintegrate our civil defence and emergency management unit right across our operations um, division. And what that means is it gives our CDM staff access to 4,500 FTEs who are in that operations division. And it, we've also made a deliberate choice to train a larger group of controllers for Auckland so that we spread our leadership capability across a, a bigger number. Uh, the next phase for us, once we get our new group plan um, across the line this year, is to start working with our communities on those community uh, resilience plans and to try and create a really meaningful role for our local board uh, leaders so that they feel that they're part of that resilience conversation and building the community empowerment model. At the same time as reintegrating civil defence and emergency management into our operations division, we have uh, started to implement a community empowerment model for community development. Uh, and just as um, Tony was um, talking about it for the Red Cross, that's exactly the same philosophy where we give resource and leadership and accountability to local communities to build up um, their view of their future and that we give them some resources to actually implement that future. Um, what we can see happening in the, you know, looking ahead and uh, what, where the re resilience conversation will go, uh, we can see conversations about sea level rise, about, you know, infrastructure resilience and whole of life costs and the, the whole notion of smart cities uh, health, safety and well-being and community engagement. We can see all of those conversations actually sitting in a, in a space that is about uh, resilience and preparedness and understanding what you should be doing in your community to, to strengthen its self-reliance and its capability to withstand um, shocks, disasters and change. And Auckland is going to continue to be a city that undergoes major change. And if we, uh, if you think about us growing at around 43,000 people per annum in three years, that is like moving the entire population of Hamilton to Auckland. And if, if it was to continue for six years, we would do that twice. So that community change is the thing that we talk about the most. And interestingly, our executive team have just set themselves three uh, challenges that they would like to look back in a decade and say, we made a meaningful difference as a team to these things. And they are to get towards the front of the growth curve, to do something about transport, and most importantly, to lift the success of all Aucklanders and particularly focusing on Aucklanders who are currently less successful than others. And 
this resilience conversation and the community engagement and empowerment plays right into that space to take a third of New Zealand's population and make sure that those who are least successful currently get the biggest uh, helping hand from an organisation like ours to actually grow them as successful and contributing citizens. So that's our little story. I'm happy to take questions, I guess, at the end of it all. Thank you.